I skipped right by, but would now like to call to the microphone Michael Dillon, Director of Digital Communities AG. Thank you, and good afternoon. I'd like to clarify that AG uh, refers to the Americas group, if you will, and it's for IBM Corporation. Uh, my organization and the people who I work with are largely responsible for the battleground I like to call digital communities, in essence, municipal wireless. If it's San Francisco, Philadelphia, New York, and most other major cities across the country, we have been involved in at least taking a look at those RFPs as they hit the street and assessing what the business models are that are coming from the government entity. Largely, and as I think most of you know, digital inclusion and particularly education has been at the forefront of many of these things. What we've done is we've dealt with the issue specifically as it applies to these business models. So in the limited amount of time that we have, what I'd like to do is share with you some of the things that we've learned. These involve the monetary aspects of this. In essence, how do we monetize these networks and get to the place where we don't rely on digital inclusion and education to carry the day, but we let them win by or be a windfall beneficiary of it. In essence, we've looked at ways that government can actually come to the table, bring additional constituents, bring a broader community to bear, and to focus on this issue so that affordable broadband, in many cases free broadband, can be offered. So what I'd like to do is, is avail to you some of the, the observations that have been made. One of them, and probably first and foremost, is to bring money. A lot of times what we're seeing is initiatives that are not getting off the ground because digital inclusion is being attacked at the whim of the vendor. And what happens is we get down to the negotiation table, we sit down, we get near the end of the deal, and one of the first things to go is digital inclusion. Those lofty principles that come out on paper starting off, by the time it gets down to the point that you are exposed in the latter part of a procurement, tend to go by the wayside. And all of a sudden, those initiatives and things you set out to do here with this fine committee aren't going to be realized. Second thing is issues of privacy. When you set out to do it, the business models can significantly impair your ability to govern your own privacy. And that's to determine as a community what it is that you will want to do, what it is that's acceptable to you, and how you'll rein this in. Having a proper governance structure is certainly the first point, and, and we applaud you for having that in place, but certainly you have to figure out exactly how much you are going to legislate and influence what the community does with this network once it's built. Effectively, in as much as you may be bringing education, bringing capability, and bringing reach to your constituents and to your students, you're also taking down the fences around the schoolyard. And so what we've probably spent the last two decades or more building up tends to be taken away when children have unfettered access to the internet away from home. Finally, Rome wasn't built in a day. Some of the expectations that you need to do and can and, and definitely make part of your plan is to not set expectations, in particular in areas like uh, indoor coverage. Basically, you need to find out who really wants this. You need to find out and certainly pay attention to how they will go about using it and understand that dynamic before you deploy the network, for that matter, field day and RFP. So I'll stop with that. Certainly, we would love to uh, assist in any way that we can in talking to you <coughs> more. But I'd, that's the statement I'd like to make today to you, and hopefully that, uh, that gives you some of our insights. Thank you. David? Please. Thank you. Um, so you've looked at RFPs that government has put out. Yes. The Eastern Seaboard, I presume? Or? So who's doing a good job out there? Excellent question. Uh, I would say probably if you look at some of the cities, Miami Beach, Hartford, Connecticut, um, I would say to a large extent the folks in Minneapolis are doing an excellent job in Corpus Christi, Texas. Um, all of them. Okay, have, let me ask you another question. Mm -hmm. Who's doing a bad job out there? All right. <laughs> uh, let's not call them a bad job. Let's say who's challenged. Uh, if, we look at <laughs> if we look at who's challenged, uh, our friends in Philadelphia probably are getting off the ground now after two years. Uh, they launched an initiative course, and two years it took them to get away from the negotiating table and actually start deployment. It's not that they're doing a bad job, but they're not seeing the aggressive timetable that they set out to because of all the maturations of the procurement itself. Just one quick follow-up question. Please. Uh, a, have you reviewed any RFPs that the city's put out? And yes. And B, how would you improve their business models so that the uh, more competition could be introduced into this city? Uh, thank you for asking that. Uh, you're a huge city. You got a lot of people, you need a lot of money brought to the table, which means you need large integrators like an IBM and others. 
Uh, consequently, if the business model is not well thought out on behalf of the city, that's the other side of the coin. The vendor, the service provider, whoever they are, they will have their own business model. But the city has to have one that is equally well thought out and grounded in reality in order for a large corporation to come up and not see the proposition as risky. Nobody wants to make false starts in this. So I would say for New York, certainly part of the consideration you want to bring to the table is to pare it down and piecemeal it, but do it in such a fashion that you can keep the momentum going and prioritize where and when you'll deploy on a steady course. By trying to bite off too much too fast, what you create is a horse pill that nobody can swallow, be it corporate America or anyone else. And that leaves you to deal with smaller firms that really don't have the financial strength to carry this off. Thank you. Yes, sir. Jose. You mentioned inclusion. Have you done any study or are you familiar with uh, the cost of not doing inclusion? Can you look to that? Yeah, you know, it's, it's one of those things that you have to take that on a community by community basis and take a look at it. However, uh, some places, and you might want to be in touch with Tucson, Arizona. Uh, Tucson has very, very clear thoughts about this, as does um, Tempe, Arizona. They felt so compelled to move us ahead with this because they did not want to determine what the cost was of not moving ahead with it. They figured that this was a competitive position. They did not want to see the students going to their universities, come in to get educated and leave with their tax dollars and their families and raise generations outside of areas that did not have these services to offer. So it was very compelling for them to bring people in and then retain them and hopefully have the think tanks and the thought processes and the innovation inherent with that, those, those newly educated people stay right there in Tempe and stay right there in Tucson. Uh, again, you have to measure this based upon your own brain drain, we call it. You know, if you see people are moving out, if they can only get these services in remote areas, they're gonna go there. As, as society changes, as the baby boomers are aging, as they have multi-generation families in the home again, there's a need for monitoring, remote monitoring, and things like this that go far beyond just what we'll do for education, but really enable the, you know, the two-income family to function and work in a mobile world. So this is the way things are going. Some would say that it's as big as electricity. And for all those reasons, it's something that most communities feel compelled to do. But I think you can inventory what you're losing and what you have to gain and come up with your own assessment of where you stand and what that cost of doing nothing is. Can you share with us uh, some, you know, anything that you might have in writing uh, in terms of your company's experience in addressing this issue? I can share with you, we've probably got a few white papers. They'll talk at a very high level. I'm more than happy to see that you get a hold of those. Uh, they'll talk in terms of what the programs are on a, on a global basis. Right now, the U.S. has slid to about position 17. Uh, Asia Pacific is leading in broadband penetration and adaptation. And you know, this is part of our global economy, the ability to field and grow businesses right here, the ability of the average individual to start a business and to do it at lower cost is really what you're competing for. So it's at about that level that we can deliver some content to you that might be helpful.